<laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce Tim Baxter's seminar today. Tim is a student of the Climate College. He's also a fellow of the law school. Uh, and his background is in climate law and planning law. His uh, MPhil research topic is in climate litigation. It's a very interesting <laughs> topic, but not what he's talking about today. Uh, today he'll be talking about a very politically sensitive issue. So I think he's going to be quite careful about uh, his slides and making sure that everything is quite factual. Uh, and so similarly, we'd ask for your questions to... Uh, maybe lean more towards the fact-based rather than the political. Um, we're going to be trialling a new method for the questions today. We're going to be using Slido. So use your phones or your computers to go to slido.com. Use the hashtag canter, C-A-N-T-E-R. It'll be on the slide, so you'll be able to see that if you forget it. Um, so please ask your questions on the Slido app or go on and vote for someone else's question. Um, and that way we'll prioritise the questions that are most popular. I think Tim's going to speak for 45 minutes um, and then we'll have time to address some of those questions. We also have a number of online viewers, uh, so we'll take some questions from them as well. Okay, the floor is yours, Tim. That's on. Um, hi, uh, as uh, Nitz introduced me, um, my name is Tim Baxter. Um, I am a fellow at the law school. Um, I teach lots, um, so this will be a little bit teachy in that sense. Um, uh, I'm also a, an associate of the college, um, have been with the college for three years-ish, something like that, um, and working on a project on climate litigation. That's sort of how I got into this, um, although I've been working in the climate space for about uh, just shy of a decade now um, in various roles in various areas, um, looking across the branches from climate adaptation through to other stuff. Um, before I get into things, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and future. Um, and note that we meet on land that was never ceded um, by the traditional owners. As mentioned before, um, we're doing something a bit different for the questions. We're trialling this. We'll see how it goes today. Hopefully it works well. Um, so it's a website that you can go to on your phone or an iPad or anything else like that. If you don't have your phone or your iPad, I'm pretty sure that if you ask nicely for the person next to you, they might let you enter in a question. Um, so you go to slido.com and the event code is Canter. And in there, you can enter in your questions, or if you see a question that you really like, you can upvote it. So you can give it a, a I think it's a thumbs up, I can't remember what it is, um, to make sure that it's at the top of the list, um, which means it's more likely to get asked. Um, with that, let's kick off. So a quick note before we start, the charts that I'm using today are a little bit simplified. Um, this is intentional. And I've tried to make sure that where I've simplified those charts, I've simplified them in a principled way. I'm not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes when I do this. It's just to make it so that it's easier to explain. In reality, when you look at my emissions charts, there should be probably three or four different lines for our historic emissions when you're calculating our, our baselines. And that's because as the government's data on what's happening improves or their methods for estimation in certain areas. Each year when the new round of emissions projections come out, that line shifts quite dramatically, um, which is something that makes it hard to work in this space. So when we set our uh, target for the 2008 to 2012 period, the first Kyoto commitment period, we thought our 1990 emissions were something quite different to what we think they are today. So just full transparency, I have simplified it, but I'm not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. Second thing on that same thing, keep your eyes on my Y axes. Um, a few people who've looked at my slides have, uh, who have more of a science background than I do. I haven't been formally trained as a science scientist, although I've had to learn a lot of this stuff over the course of my research. But I want you to be able to see what's happening. So my y-axis 
more often than not, do not start from zero. And again, I'm not trying to hide, pull the wool over your eyes. I'm just trying to make things visible. So Australia so far has had three commitment periods under the UNFCCC. The UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework, uh, the Convention on Climate, Buttons, just leave it. <laughs> ah. Oh, I lost the whole deal. Now I've lost the fuzzy thing. The fuzzy thing has gone in my shirt. This is exactly what I want. I'll get home tonight, take off my clothes, and go, what the hell? Um, so the first QF, uh, yep. that is on? Yes, good. The first commitment period that we had under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, I'm going to call Kyoto CP1 the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, Kyoto CP2, the second, and then we have Paris, which is a different beast entirely to the two that came before. The first commitment period um, was first negotiated in 1997. Um, our environment minister went over to the UNFCCC Conference of the Parties and negotiated a really sweet deal for Australia. Really sweet deal. So sweet that when he got back to Parliament, he actually got a standing ovation. Um, that target, as I have here, covers the period of 2008 to 2012. That's five years, not four years, because it starts from 1st of January, ends on 31st of December. And our target for that was that we could only increase our emissions by 8% over that period. We have the second uh, second weakest target under the Kyoto Protocol. I think it was Iceland had plus 10%. Uh, that only bound countries that were members of the OECD at the time. So there are other countries who are now members of the OECD that were never bound to commitment period one or commitment period two. Australia was. That completely wrapped up as in all of the accounting and everything was put to bed by 2015. The second target was pledged by Australia at Copenhagen in 2009, that very, very big, very, very monumental uh, conference of the parties that happened back then. That was around about the time that uh, the Liberal Party changed leaders in the opposition from Malcolm Turnbull to Tony Abbott. And that conference was generally considered a pretty big failure. Um, nothing came out of it, but we pledged that in that, that we would aim for 5% below 2000 levels by 2020. That commitment, which was finally, uh, put into proper, well, sort of proper law, um, a couple of years later, the Doha amendment covers the period from 2013 to 2020. So eight years, not seven. Um, it is a binding agreement, and it is the one that we're currently under, but it's not actually law yet. Um, we're not actually legally required to comply with that target at all, as of yet. Whether we do or whether we don't, will come down to how many parties to the UN sign a letter of acceptance. At the moment, we have 124, I think, as of January, and in order for it to become law, at least 144, have to indicate their acceptance. We now have a bit less than two years until this agreement is complete and whether we get another 20 signatures in that time, I don't know. So it may never become law, but it is technically a binding target if it does. The third is Paris and that we submitted in the lead up to the 2015 Paris uh, Conference of the Parties and under the Paris Agreement, our target is, uh, covers the period of 2021 to 2030. Again, that's a full 10 years, not nine. Um, and our target is from, oh, my hyphen, my minus symbol has turned into a hyphen there, is between 26% and 
on 2005 levels by 2030. That target isn't binding and it will never become binding. Under the Paris Agreement, you have to submit a target, but you aren't bound to comply with that target. Um, so should we fail to meet the Paris target, there will be no consequence, perhaps a little finger wagging, and that will be the extent of it. For the purpose of this seminar, I'm going to ignore the 28% component um, just because it makes things unnecessarily complicated. And if you imagine this as a target, really the only thing that we have to meet, if we have to meet anything, is the 26%. So that's what I've charted. Oh, goodness me. I'm going to fall over and do myself an injury. One thing that's really important and one thing that several set, lots and lots of experts don't get right about this is that all of our targets are a budget calculated over the entire period. They're not an end point. So there was some ANU research that came out uh, Friday, two Fridays ago, um, which has been not many people who work in the space think a lot of that of that particular piece of research and there's a lot of been a lot of criticism of it for better or worse the author said if we do this then we'll meet paris it's a big if and i think people are contesting over whether that if is actually a possible if but one thing that they definitely didn't get right is that they didn't calculate the paris target as a budget they said it's an end point and we have to get below 26 percent and then we've met paris that is wrong it is, it's something you could say, if you've met 26% early, you're very likely to meet the eventual target. It's very difficult to fail under those circumstances, but it's not impossible. And same thing, a uh, Reputex report that I was looking at last night does the exact same thing. Lots and lots of experts do this. It's not, it, it, it's an oversimplification, but it's an unnecessary oversimplification. Calculating this stuff correctly isn't actually that hard once you know what you're doing. So there's a few different ways that you can calculate that target. Um, the standard way for the Kyoto Protocol was this thing called Kelros or Kelros, I can't pronounce, I can't even pronounce that, whatever, however you would pronounce that. Um, which is the idea of a flat target over the period. You then say, so if we say 8%, actually, no, I'll park that for a second. I'll just show you on the chart. It's easier. Or the way that the Australian government has started to talk about its second Kyoto target is as a trajectory. And then in the Paris Agreement, we have done a trajectory. You'll see this on the charts in a second, so I don't really need to go into too much detail. Never, ever have any of our targets been just an endpoint target. It's not just about being 26% below that whenever that happens or just 26 below that in 2030 for our Paris target. It's calculated across the whole time. So this is our emissions as of the most recent government uh, emissions projections, which lovely for me came out on my birthday um, in December. Um, a beautiful birthday present. Um, and that's what we currently think our emissions look like through time. So up to here, 2018, back there you can say historical kind of stuff, and here's the projections going forward. What you see there is there's kind of a big lumpiness to our emissions in the past, um, and over the future, there's just a slight increase through time. Again, not zero. Um, if you were to draw just a linear trend line through that, it would be a slight increase since 1990. Um, yes, and I've already said that. <laughs> all of the data that I'm using today, the calculations are mine, but the data source is all from that emissions projections, which is one um, data source that the government uses. So if we look at our first Kyoto commitment period target, that was a target of plus 8% on 1990 levels um, over the period of 2008 to 2012. And what you do there, it's, it's just a bit of geometry, just sort of fairly basic maths. You're just calculating the shape of that square. The line at the top goes straight across at 
108% of 1990 levels with some finessing for the Australia clause, which I'm not gonna go into today because it makes it unnecessarily complicated. And you're just calculating that from 19, 1990. What I do need to say here is that what I've calculated here isn't actually what happened for the Kyoto period. I have adjusted up a little bit because our emissions have gone up. Our calculation of historic emissions have gone up. So I am slightly misrepresenting things here. Where the line should be is where this dash is here across the top, which is a couple of, um, a couple of million tonnes per year lower than where I've drawn it. The reason I've done that is to put it in a relative position to our highest ever emissions. Our emissions, our baseline, that line across the top for the Kyoto Commitment Period 1, is very slightly above our highest ever emissions. Very slightly, not very much, but if I would draw it in the correct place, it slightly misrepresents the truth. The drop of emissions in this period has nothing to do with the carbon price. The carbon pricing mechanism that was, that was brought in by the ALP only covers the last year of that. And while you might be able to say, okay, this, this period is pretty much perfectly matches when Kevin Rudd was in power and you have quite a steep decline in the emissions. While you might be able to say that the Labor Party was talking about emissions a lot and maybe just talking about the problem of emissions has brought them down, I will show you, as I will show you in a minute, it's, that's not true. It is purely, or the kickoff for that decrease matches almost perfectly with the start of the global financial crisis where our productivity went down, as did our emissions over time. Mostly agricultural emissions in that sense that, that change. Agricultural and land use, land use change in forestry, which I'll talk to in a little bit. We beat the target for Kyoto by, uh, by the government's calculations by 128 million tonnes. The government is keeping that as credit in our back pocket. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Then move on to my first one of the, mis or second, I suppose, second one of the mistakes that I'm going to chart. Our commitment period two target is not, even though it on paper it is 5% below 2000 levels over the period from 2013 to 2020, that's not actually right. This is because in the, in the international agreement for the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, all of the targets were standardized and they were standardized back to 1990. So our actual legal target, should the second period of Kyoto come into force, is actually 99.5% of 1990 levels, not 5% below 2000 levels. And that becomes important because a couple of years ago, there was this big revision to our emissions. One of the reasons that the Australian government chose 2000 as its base year when it was communicating it was because back then, 2000 had higher emissions than 1990 and it made us look better. It was, it was it's pure marketing. If we chose 2000, that was a better year. After the revision to our emissions that happened in 2015, 2016, as you can see on the chart, 1990 is now higher. And because that target is calculated against 1990 as 99.5% of 1990, then our emissions baseline should be higher than that. <laughs> Don't do it. It's wrong. Um, very subtle, I thought. Um, <laughs> so this is what the baseline looks like as far as the UN is concerned. Our baseline, as far as the UN is concerned, is a total budget over that period of 4,512 million tonnes, give or take, um, give or take a few decimals. Um, and that is calculated as 99.5% of 1990 levels as a straight line across the whole period. We beat that target, or we will beat that target if the projections that we have at the moment hold. Uh, by 375 million tonnes. So we'll beat it quite comfortably. Um, in its communication over the target domestically though, the Australian government doesn't do this. It actually calculates it wrong. 
And I can't work out why it calculates it wrong because it calculates it wrong even to the point of counting that credit that we're going to keep in our back pocket. Um, and they're actually doing themselves a disservice by doing that. So I'm gonna say this next bit really quietly. This is how the Australian government calculates our target. It's a linear trajectory. The high point up here is drawn actually from the middle of the Kyoto Protocol period as 8% above 1990 levels in 2010, which is smack in the middle of the Kyoto, um, first Kyoto commitment period. And then it's a linear trajectory drawn down to 5% below 2000 levels in 2020. And what you have there is a total budget that is less than the total budget that we can spend if we were to calculate it correctly. And I don't know why they're doing it that way. Um, I literally don't know why they're doing it that way. I have tried desperately to find out what it should be. So in the most recent version of the emissions projections, the government says we're going to over accomplish on Kyoto commitment period two by 240 million tonnes. Part of that comes from this point here, which is pre 2018, where we were never anywhere close to our um, emissions. And then you subtract to that, uh, subtract from that the period post 2018, where we're expected to go a little bit above our baseline. But it's like a household budget in the sense that if you save more in the first half of the month, you can spend more in the second half of the month. It's no different in that way. Um, it's just that when you're calculating your total at the end, if you spent more in the end of the month, you're not doing as well as you would have otherwise. But it's, that's fine. That's not violating any agreement or anything, even if this did come into law. If we were to turn this into a flat line, like we did with Kyoto Commitment Period 1, rather than this uh, diagonal, it would be a 3.6% reduction on 1990 levels over the whole period. So we've gone from plus eight to what is equivalent to minus 3.6 as the next step down. <clears throat> as I said at the start, the, the, this period is not actually law yet. So it's a bit like passing a bill through parliament. You need to get the required number of votes before it actually becomes law um, in the same sense here. So we need to have 20 more signatures from various countries around the world before we can say that it is actually a law. Finally, we have Paris. Paris Agreement draws a, that continues that same thing of doing a linear traje trajectory downward. And we go from negative five on 2000 levels in uh, 2020, the end of our last period, through to negative 26 on 2005 levels in 2030. The government says frequently at the moment, we will meet this target in a canter. And that's the phrase that gets rolled out, in a canter. It's a really specific phrase and it's really weird, I think, personally. I don't know many people who still use that phrase anymore in the 21st century, but fine not on the government's own data. The government's own projections that they have for that period do not meet Paris. And in fact, our emissions on the government's own data never even touch the line. We're supposed to be going down by the baseline and our emissions are going up. Only slightly up, really. If, if I was to draw this again, if I was to draw this chart from zero, the gradient's not that steep, but it's still the wrong direction. That amount, that space here, just doing that basic geometry, is 695 million tonnes by the government's own numbers in the government's own reports. And that's a big difference. That's quite a significant proportion of our emissions. It's about 10% of what we're going to be doing over the time. 600, a bit more than 10%. 695 million tonnes is quite a lot higher than our emissions have ever been for a single year. So that's the, our highest ever emissions was in 2007, where we hit about 
620. I can't remember, I should have had that number off the top of my head. We hit about 620 in that year, 695. So it's, we need to get rid of about 10% of our highest ever year equivalent. <clears throat> Currently, yep, I've got that. And that's the government's baseline scenario. I should say that the government's baseline scenario is very conservative. In reality, our emissions probably will never follow the line that is in the projections. And a big part of that is because of the rollout of renewables, which the government has proved over the years that they've been doing these projections, which I think stem back to about 2013 when we first did it. They have always failed to accurately predict what is happening in um, renewables into electricity every single year. But even if you take things like uh, the Australian ele electricity market operators, uh, energy market operators, oh, goodness, I've forgotten what AMO stands for for a second because I'm in front of a room. Um, their most recent integrated system plan and look at what they say is gonna happen on a, just a normal kind of uh, approach, which is a, the, what they call the neutral scenario. And this is work that Alan Pierce, who's in the room, um, uh, printed a week ago, not even a week ago, days ago. Uh, what's that? Monday. Monday. Um, if you look at that, we're about, we should be about somewhere in about the middle on, the, um, on AMO's ISP. We still fail, but not by nearly as much as the government says we're gonna fail. The last step is one that's tricky and it's controversial internationally. And the Australian government never played its hand on whether it was going to do this until, not formally, until that report came out on, came out on my birthday, 21st of December, buy me presents. Um, it's okay, it's not too late. Um, it's only two months late. Um, the government hadn't formally said it was gonna do this until then. And then it came out in that report and a whole bunch of us who follow this space went, oh, they finally put it in there. That is to carry forward, uh, hang on. Oh, sorry, one last thing on the Paris target. Doing that same thing I did of making it standard for Kyoto and making it a flat line. Our target for Paris is 16%, 16.7% um, below 1990 levels. And that's just turning that line so it's flat and finding the midpoint. Oh, I forgot that I put this slide in there. Malt, this was Malta's suggestion because he said no one will believe me that the government actually did this. Um, this is what was in the report, was a table of our emissions, a, a, a task. This is straight from the report that came out. Um, our emissions task, so there it has what they expect our emissions to be over the period, which is 5,487 5, million tonnes of... Uh, carbon dioxide equivalent gases over the full decade. They said our budget is 4,800 million tonnes over that period. And that's where you get the 695 with a little bit of um, stuff that I'm not going to go into because it's so small that it's not worth going into. Um, so we have 8 million tonnes of voluntary action that's counted a bit funny. So you get 695 million tonnes of failure in that sense of how much we're going over. And then the government went, we're gonna deduct the amount that we overachieved in Kyoto from that and say that's our, that's our credit. That's what we have in our bank account from previous months where we saved it up. That's actually okay under Kyoto, sort of. Carrying it forward from one period to the next period is fine. The problem, and Malta wanted me to specifically mention this rule because he's very, very proud of this particular rule, is that you can't carry it too forward. So we have this thing called the previous period surplus reserve, which says you can get credit for your over accomplishments last period, but not from the one before. So carrying forward the 100, uh, sorry, the 240 million tons from Kyoto commitment period two, that second period, is kind of fine under Kyoto, with some finessing. Carrying forward the stuff from commitment period one is absolutely not fine. It is not something that you can do. If Paris was Kyoto protocol commitment period three, we wouldn't be able to carry that forward, but it's not 
It's a different rule book. And the rules on this are being renegotiated. There were ideas around the conferences of the parties, those annual meetings of the UNFCCC saying, we should make sure that whatever happens with the rules in Paris, they should be stronger. Oh, sorry, whatever happens with the rules for Paris, they should be stronger than they were in Kyoto, but those aren't laws. It's just sort of agreed statement of facts. So the law could go either way on this. What you get then is you can trans, if, if the government can in fact transfer this credit, personally, I think there will not be a rule on it, which means we can kind of do whatever we want um, for the Paris Agreement. If there's no rule, Paris is meant to be this bottom up thing where people decide their own rules for how they're going to account for things. And if there is no rule, no one specifically prohibits it, then Australia can do whatever the hell it wants with those credits, which means that they can carry them forward even from two periods back, or one, yeah, two periods back. That's kind of like a de facto ad addition onto our baseline. And so I've added it to the baseline for this particular chart. And what you have there, so our Paris Agreement budget is uh, 4,800 million tonnes. Again, you add the 367 million tonnes that we have as overachievements from the previous periods, and you end up with, what is it, 5,167 uh, 5, as our baseline. And then we turn that into a baseline across the entire period and say this is our de facto baseline. That means that our target for the end of Paris is just short of 1% below our target for the end of commitment period two. Australia's target, the 26% below 2005 levels by 2030, is already one of the weaker in the world as far as the Paris Agreement goes. Certainly not, certainly in the developed world, we are the weakest, I think is fairly safe to say, or at least we're in the like bottom three. But if you add that carryover credit, we go from being on the weaker end of the developed world to being the weakest, unquestionably the weakest target. Uh, yeah, that's all I have on that one. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Australia's emissions. I didn't hit timer on here, what's the time? Cool, I'm gonna be going very quickly through the rest of my slides but we'll, go, we'll get there. There's a bit at the end that I was thinking of leaving off and if anyone wants to talk to me, they can talk to me about it, which is when I do the same test for the ALP's policy. So what we have is in Australia's emissions, is you see this bumpy line that we have over time? It's kind of, it's, it's real in the sense of our emissions. If you put a cap over Australia, it would be, it's absolutely real, but it sort of hides a lot. Australia's emissions are driven this, this lumpiness is driven by land use, land use change and forestry. Um, so what happens if we get rid of land use, land use change and forestry? What happens to our emissions? You lose all of the lumps and all you have is up. Aside from one tiny little bit in the middle. And as I say, using land use, land use change and forestry emissions is fine. It is actually part of our emissions and it's emissions that we have control over, but it's also emissions that are very easy for us to control. This big drop in our total emissions here was from the Hawke uh, Labor government bringing in stricter land clearing um, rules. Didn't really actually change very much about our society. In fact, most people don't, didn't even notice it. But you can see that drop and if you compare it to what happens if you remove it, that's huge. So I'm gonna, hang on, I'll talk this little lump. So that's the ALP's uh, carbon pricing mechanism, that period there that I've highlighted. That is about 25 million tonnes. So the ALP's carbon pricing mechanism, don't get me wrong, it was only in force, only in law for two years. It couldn't have done a lot in that much time but it really didn't make a huge difference to our emissions. Remembering again, not starting from zero. You start from zero and that bump is, is a blip in our emissions. Only six out of 28 years from 1990 to the present have not been all time records for non Lulu CF emissions. And where none of the years, none of the recent years have been that. 
Flicking over to our Lulu CF emissions, land use, land use change in forestry, you see 1990 was a huge, huge spike. Then we have a little bit of a sort of plateauing happening here. And then there's another big drop off after about 2006. And that's where the lumpiness of our emissions profile comes from. The recent data back about five years, a Lulu CF is very unreliable. There is stuff there that should be here that is not there like the period where the Queensland government had no land, no effective land clearing regime, which is not in the government's data yet. But I won't go into that. If we get rid of Lulu CF and just count, and pretend we're a country that has no land, which is a bit of a weird thing to, to say, I know, especially for Australia, and calculate the budgets again, we would have failed that generous target we had under Kyoto. Um, Kyoto Commitment Period 1, we would have failed Commitment Period 2, and our outstanding task for Paris doubles. So we are more than anything else driven by land use, land use change in forestry, historically. I'm going to go a whirlwind tour. This was meant to be a whirlwind tour, but now that I've gone for too long, it's going to be breakneck. I don't even know what it's going to be. Total emissions profile here. Huge amount of our emissions come from electricity, uh, 33%. Direct combustion and transport are equalish next at about 18%. Those are what we would normally call energy, at, at least at a, at a, most of us would call energy. But keeping our language clear, electricity is not energy. Direct combustion is the burning of coal to run things like smelters on site where you're not actually converting to electricity. And transport is also energy, but it's out on our roads. So we keep very clear on the language distinction between those if we want to represent things properly. And then we have another few things. I'll go through these quickly. This is what, basically what I'm doing here is I'm prorating our Paris target. In the same way as I just stripped Lulu CF and said, how do we perform against the various commitment periods? I'm doing the same thing, but I'm pretending electricity is a country. Direct combustion is a country. Our Paris target is not sectoral. This is not legitimate analysis to say, do we meet Paris? This is meant to give you a sense of where the opportunities lie or where we're not doing well and where we are doing well. Definitely, it is not legitimate to say we meet Paris in the electricity sector, as certain people have been prone to say over the last couple of months. But, yeah. So, electricity as a whole, we do not meet Paris. If electricity was a country, we would fail on commitment period two and we would fail on Paris. This has been something that's been in the media a lot lately is that we will meet Paris in the electricity sector, not on the government's projections. Certainly, if you look at other scenarios, we do, but not on the government's data. Where we do meet Paris, where that talking point comes from, is in the national electricity market, which is not the entirety of Australia. It is all of our, the electricity that's going to all of our major cities are down the east, and, east coast and South Australia. So we would meet Paris there. You have a, a drop off, you actually get below 26% about five years early in the national electricity market. That does not mean we meet Paris five years early. It then ticks up and that tick up could be bigger. We don't know yet the projections, our, our government data for projections, especially for the electricity sector, are bad. Very, very bad. We are not good at it. It will probably go down, but we don't know. Direct combustion, that burning of, of fossil fuels and uh, things to power our smelters. Fail Kyoto commitment period two and fail Paris. Transport across the board, that's cars and domestic travel and trucks and all sorts of stuff like that, we fail on both. Fugitive emissions, the leakage of various uh, greenhouse gases directly from mines and uh, LNG export facilities and stuff like that, leaky pipes and leaky mines. Fail Kyoto Commitment Period 2, fail Paris. You're getting a sense of what's happening here? Agriculture, farms, we meet Kyoto commitment period two for the agricultural sector, fail Paris. 
Industrial processes, all of those powerful greenhouse gases that come out of our various plants, like chemical manufacturing, plastic manufacturing, that kind of stuff around the country, bail Kyoto commitment period to bail Paris. I didn't leave waste till last just because it's the only one where we pass both. Um, it's actually the order that they, the running order that they are in the government's data. I have done it in exactly the same order. Waste, we meet Kyoto commitment period to and we meet Paris. That's 2% of our emissions. Yay! Do you know why we meet it there? Because we're paying a huge amount of money to have uh, capture and combustion of waste gases out, or leakage from landfill sites. Huge amounts of money. We're paying them kind of three times over. And of course, the sector's gonna move. They can make a mint if they move in that direction. But that's research for another day. So I can do ALP policy, good. I wanna do this because there's been some talking points about the ALP's target that have been saying that the um, Labor Party's target is compliant with what the Climate Change Authority said in its 2014 target setting back then. It's not. Only by a little bit on the target itself, but by quite a bit on the budget. So Australia's target for, uh, Australia, the, sorry, Australia's target if the ALP come into power is that they're going to revise our uh, Paris pledge and make it negative 45% on 2005 levels rather than negative 26%. That necessarily means that if you use the government's data, we fail by more because it's the government's data, they, you only have one data set. And if you fail on one, you, of course you're gonna fail on a bigger one. I've tried to plot what I can of ALP's uh, policy announcements that they've made so far, but I can't actually plot most of them. So really the only thing that I could plot here in revising down the government's projections was the effect of the ALP's version of the National, Electric National Energy Guarantee that they're, bringing, that they're planning to bring in. And that's it. The rest of it I can't plot. So this plot is a little bit unfair to the ALP. That said, we really kind of need more information about what their um, announcements are on climate. We need more detail. They've talked to the idea of increasing the force of the safeguard mechanism, but not provided any, any information on it. There are announcements for new funding to the CEFC which I can't plot because you don't know where the CEFC is actually going to um, invest. These will, between the two of them, I mean, safeguard mechanism, so long as they do a decent job of it, bring our emissions down. But I just can't put it on the chart. On ALP's policies, taking out only the National Energy Guarantee, they overshoot by just over a gigaton. But again, slightly unfair. The thing that's not unfair is that the ALP's target is not compliant with the advice from the Climate Change Authority. The Climate Change Authority recommended for our targets when it did its targets review in 2014, uh, 2014? 2014? Yes, 2014. When it did its targets review, it gave a range of targets that were fair for Australia and it gave a budget out to 2050. The range of targets was 40 to 60% below uh, 2000 levels. The ALP's target is 45% below 2005 levels because they have a different base here, which I probably should have left both on the chart if I'd thought about the fact that I was gonna do this properly. Um, 2005 is quite a lot higher than 2000. And so the ALP's target, if you convert it to 2000 levels is only 39.2 and it doesn't meet the minimum standard, 0.8% probably not a big deal in that sense. It's pretty damn close. What's not close is that the Climate Change Authority also calculated a total amount of emissions that we should release in the period from 2013 through to 2050. And they came up with this figure of 10,100 million tonnes as the total emissions that we can release over that period. And the ALP's target does not meet that by quite a way, uh, by, what is it, 
1.9 gigatons over the whole period. So it's not Climate Change Authority uh, compliant. I've also charted here, because there's been a little bit of prevarication from the ALP about whether they're going to use those targets, you notice the statements that have been coming out from the Labor ministers have been things like, we're not in favour of using these kinds of targets, but not, not using these kinds of accounting tricks, sorry, these kinds of accounting tricks, the things with carrying over the credit. It has not been, we will not use those credits. And so what I suspect is that the ALP is also keeping that same um, accounting trick in its back pocket. If we get closer to 2030 and we're a long way from negative 45, meeting that target of negative 45% that they've set, I expect those credits will start getting pulled out. But the ALP doesn't have to play its hand on that for a long time. And really, neither did the Liberal Party. There's no reason that we have to declare that ahead of time. This kind of accounting stuff happens after the end of the period. So when I said Kyoto Protocol kind of wound up in 2015, properly all the accounting that's two and a half three years after the end of the actual commitment period where you do all of the accounting and balance your books so there's quite a long way between it last slide thankfully i've i've gone decently over time but that's fine i did say to needs before i am going to stick to time did not work our current approach to target setting in australia has been one of systematic pessimism if you look at all of the various projections that have happened um, for, back from the first, which I think I said is 2012, 2013, when we did our first full whole of economy projections data, it's always this, up, up, up. And our emissions haven't followed that. They have overestimated what our emissions will be in the future systematically. And so when we set our targets, we set them based on where we expect the emissions to be. We're very bad at, at deciding, at working out where the emissions are supposed to be, set it way too high, then set our targets with insufficient ambition. There's no good reason to do this. We have enough history to show that maybe we should be a little bit less conservative with our projections. Historically, Australia's natural advantages in terms of reducing emissions have been squandered by governments of all stripes. This is not a partisan attack. We have not done enough in virtually any sector over time. If the ALP's target actually gets shifted to 45% for 2030, that will be the first real emissions target that we've ever had. The first that will ever actually require effort. There are huge amounts of potential to reduce our emissions. Reputex released a report in 2017, which was talk, did, plotted out the marginal abatement cost of all different types of abatement in Australia. And for both the Liberal Party's current target, and they did a good guess on what the Labor Party's target was, and guessed it, even though like, it was quite a while beforehand, and for the ALP's target, both of those targets can be met with just taking advantage of the sorts of things that we can do that will actually save us money. Net, so the net cost of both targets is making money, not spending it. A great example of this. Climate Change Authority did, not, did a different report on vehicle emission standards in 2014 a 40% reduction in, our, in the emissions intensity of light vehicles. That's cars and light trucks and vans and stuff like that in Australia. Could potentially save us 59 million tonnes. Not enough to get us to any of our targets, but a good help. The cost of doing that, by the way, that, that, is, that 40% is just increasing our vehicle efficiency to the standards that are in place from the US EPA. We're not talking about EU targets. We're not talking about anything crazy here. The net cost of that is negative $350 per tonne. Per individual tonne, 59 million of them. And each shift is saving us $350, roughly. The relative lack of ambition for our targets is common across the world, but it is not inevitable. 
It is certainly not inevitable. And it is, and, and Australia's targets are, and this is well beyond the scope of this presentation, they are so far off two degrees and 1.5 degrees, especially if you take into account those credits getting carried over. We are not talking about a safe climate future out of these policies. And that's not a partisan statement. That is verifiable fact. And that's it. Thanks, Tim. I never actually expected you to keep to time, so I'm quite impressed. Did I actually keep time? More or less. <laughs> uh, so we have a number of questions on the Slido. Um, before I go to them, I'll just introduce Malte Meinchausen, who's here. He was the former director of the Climate College and is a co-director of Energy Transition Hub. It turns out that our trial of Slido, it just is a platform for Malte to critique each of Tim's slides. <laughs> so I might skip Malta's questions and you can have that conversation later. Ironically, we've, well, not ironically, uh, unsurprisingly, we've already critiqued Tim's slides. <laughs> <laughs> like for an hour and a half on Wednesday. There's been a fair bit of peer review before this presentation. <laughs> the top question, which actually plays nicely into your legal background uh, and is something that David Caroli mentioned in some interviews a few months back. Question is, are government MPs misleading parliament if they announce in the chamber that Australia is on track to meet its Paris target? Uh, so, there's a, there's a thing here is that they don't say ever on the government data, we will meet Paris. What they say is, we will meet Paris, just go and look at the data. And what, can, what you saw, and, and this is something that, uh, I think it was actually something that Christi, Christina Keneally raised in Senate estimates this week, um, was that the government is relying on hope to get us there. And it's not, it's not saying, they're not really misleading parliament, because they're saying, I hope that things will be different. And certainly they will be different to what the government's projections are. Again, the government's projections are very, very conservative. But I don't think they're misleading parliament, not in the sense of what parliamentary rules are. Um, not in the sense of them actually getting a censure motion or anything else like that. Okay. Second, or oh, the, the other most popular question, Tim, are you aware of other countries that carry over KP1 credits to meet or assist Paris target? What other country would substantially benefit from such a trick? Not in the same sense that we're doing it. So in the sense that we're doing it of carrying through um, what's called an AAU and what is it? Uh, I'm having a mental blank. Um, allocated, what is it? A Assigned amount unit. Thank you. I just sorry. Complete mental blank. I'm doing really badly at acronyms today. Um, AAUs, which is that kind of stuff that we're talking about. But there is some talk of, and most developed countries, because it's only developed countries who have these things, because it's only them who had a legal target. Almost all have said no. We're not going to use these things. We think that, and in some cases, gone so far as to say we think it's morally repugnant for us to use these things. Um, but there are some Kyoto credits that are looking to be brought into Paris, particularly uh, Brazil with the certified emissions reductions. Those are actual verifiable emissions reductions. And generally the sense with Paris is that it's meant to be a separate agreement. So you can't carry through these units. Brazil has an argument for pulling them forward. I don't know that it's an argument that I agree with, but I don't think Australia has an actual argument for why it should be able to bring forward these AAUs internationally speaking. Okay, so this is a clarification question. Um, it's about the baseline years for reductions. Why do they change between agreements? Uh, generally politics. Generally it's, and when I say politics, I don't mean domestic politics. Let me go back here um, for the benefit of the people online slash, where are we? Blah, 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 blah. There, okay. So generally it's about what looks good and what you can sell. And it's easier to say that, like when people say their percent reduction, that tends to be the thing that a lay audience or the media focuses on. They don't focus on the percent reduction of what. And so a lot of people don't notice when they say 8% above 1990 levels or 
uh, 5% below 2000 levels or 26% below two, uh, 2005 levels, that we're actually picking a higher baseline each time. As I said, now 1990 is higher than 2000, but it wasn't back then. That's a revision to our historic estimates. Uh, Stephen Pollard has asked, how accurate are Australia's emissions of LULUCF emissions slash sinks? Uh, I'm not an expert in this area, but not very would be my general um, approach to this. Getting better, um, as I mentioned briefly when we had the LULUCF slide on here, we, in the data, sorry, Nate, so I keep squishing you out the side. Um, I am not Go, go. Oh my God, my clicker needs new batteries. Desperately needs new batteries. Oh, we both did it at the same time. Back one more. Uh, back, back, back. Uh, there. Brilliant. Back here, 2015, we have uh, the Queensland government released its, the, the financial year 2015, the Queensland government released uh, data for that about 18 months ago, uh, saying that they believe that Queensland cleared uh, forests, woody, just woody vegetation to the tune of 49 million tonnes, just Queensland in that particular year. Um, and that was a result of the Campbell, uh, Campbell Newman's uh, government basically repealing all of the land clearing laws. Not quite repealing, but close enough. The government's data for that year have the total amount of emissions from forestry, so not including sinks, just people clearing land in Australia, just uh, as 44.9 million tonnes. And I think I might have misspoken before. Queensland government says 45 million tonnes came from Queensland alone. And the Commonwealth government says, 44.9 across the entire country. So there's a problem there. I don't have the subject matter expertise to be able to say who is right, but certainly it's not both of them. Yep. Yeah, so this, when I say the Can you just repeat the question for the yeah, online okay, people? Okay, so the data doesn't um, uh, show the impact of drought on the herd. The reason that I say that it's GFC is that the Lulu CF here, a lot of that is reduced economic activity. I, I think I attribute it to reduced economic activity, which means reduced expansion of farms, which means reduced forestry in a lot of cases, in those sort of broad acre things. It's not just the GFC, but I, I personally think the GFC is the dominant driver, but it's, it's many, many other factors as well. We could have a much longer discussion about that. Okay, Pia has asked, uh, you said a lot of people confuse our Paris targets as endpoints rather than a budget. Where does that confusion come from? I think it comes from the way that we talk about it. 26% below uh, 2005 levels by 2030. And that doesn't necessarily mean a budget. That doesn't necessarily mean a trajectory. Most people would say, that, okay, so we need to be 26% below in 2030. Craig Kelly, I think a uh, uh, Liberal Party backbencher did this a year ago, a year or so ago, or two years ago, 18 months-ish, and was saying that Australia should just hockey stick its emissions. We should keep our emissions high and then just drop it in 2030. Um, it's wrong. And it's fine. It's entirely defensible. Experts do this as well. It's not an indictment of Craig Kelly that he misunderstood it. When you have other people who are certifiable experts in the field making the exact same mistake. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Tim Forsey has asked a question. I suspect he probably knows the answer to it as well. Uh, what impact does unrestrained expansion of the gas slash shale, fracking, coal seam gas, LNG industry have on Australia's emissions? Um, it's been a driver of our re oh, my click is just not working at all. Just let me come over here for a second and I'll flick the slides over. Um, a decent percentage. It's been a driver of the very recent increases. Where are we? Here is that fugitives. So at least within fugitive emissions, which is only one little bit, um, 
you can see this huge uptick in our emissions from fugitives. And that's largely been driven, that increase, not fugitive emissions as a whole, but that increase is largely being driven by gas expansion. Um, and that is something that is, is driving the uptick. That is expected under the government's figures to stabilise a bit, but they're still projecting upwards. We're currently the largest LNG exporter in the world. As of last year, we pipped, uh, and Tim Forsyzy, Qatar, yeah, we, we pipped Qatar for first place. Very temporarily, Qatar likes being first place and will probably pip us back. Um, ironically, oh, ironic. why do I keep saying ironically when I do not mean ironically? At the same time, Indonesia last year pipped us for the world's top coal exporter. So we've lost our top spot for coal and gained it for LNG. Okay, we have time for one more question, but I suspect that um, Tim would be happy to answer the other questions, maybe even on Slido, if you want to, you can just yeah, post comments. Um, and I'm going to use my discretion as the chair to pick a question from Joe from the Victorian Clean Tech Fund, who's one of our partners, the Energy Transition Hub, and ties well into your last comment. Does our total emissions include effect of exported coal, et cetera, overseas? Very short answer. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, whether it should is an open question, whether we should be at least considering it. I don't think necessarily it should be counted in Australia's emissions, but we certainly should be considering the impact of our exports. And what happens with our exports is that they get attributed, the, the emissions that are created in production of those fossil fuels are counted, but the actual consumption of them, which happens in another country, our major uh, trading partner for coal is China. So those, the burning of coal is attributed to China. I don't think that's necessarily unfair as long as we have clear boundaries and there's no double counting and everything else like that. But certainly I think Australians, Australia's policies on how we deal with climate change should be considering our, the impact of our exports. Thank you, Tim. I'll ask you to join me in thanking Tim for this presentation. And while I have a captive audience, I will remind you of our upcoming presentations and seminars. They're all on our website, so please uh, log on and register if you're interested in those, and I'll leave them up there. But um, I think Tim's happy to hang around and have a chat. It's pretty hard to get Tim to stop chatting, so I'm quite sure he'll be happy to talk to you if you have any further questions. Thank you, Tim.